Welcome to TFR Let's Talk. I'm your host, Swapnil Bhartia, and my next guest is once again, Katie Stewart, VP of Dependable Embedded Systems at the Linux Foundation. You wear a lot of hats, but let's just stick to that title, Kate. It's great to have you back on the show. Thank you very much. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the executive order, which I feel is was really needed. Uh, we have talked about it so many times, especially from SPDS perspective and open source perspective. So if I ask you, when you saw this executive order, what were your thoughts uh, when you read it? Uh, what came to you and you're like, yep, we're already doing this and this is a great initiative. Well, I was absolutely delighted to see the term software bill of materials in there. Actually, I think uh, one person, I didn't do it directly, so I might say, but I think it shows up 11 times in the executive order. And uh, SPDX has been, you know, generating software bills of materials now for about 11 years uh, for projects. And seeing that emphasis on trying to improve the software transparency and what software is there, that was what made me really excited, especially since, um, you know, what the executive order is trying for here is they're using the fact that the purchasing is going to be expecting that. And the U.S. government has uh, enough clout to actually make the industry serve, ah, well, maybe we finally have to move ourselves over there and actually do it. Because a lot of companies are already generating these software bill of materials. Um, you know, we've seen this coming from licensing, for mergers and acquisitions. Um, you know, this type of information has been out there and has been adopted, um, but it hasn't been used widely in the security space. And Right now, what we're trying to do is, you know, the same software transparency you need for licensing and, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions and these types of topics is very useful for security. So getting it to the stage where we can, you know, have it widely disseminated and it's just expected that every time you make a bill, you get an SBOM is where we, we need to go. And so the fact that SBOMs are mentioned in the executive order and realistically as well, you know, it's not just in the U.S., it's also in Europe. Um, uh, last fall, I guess it was in November, uh, in the Europe, the ANISA um, had the IoT Cybersecurity Act that came out. And it's also asking for an SBOM too. So the awareness is growing worldwide that we need to have it. And, you know, we have various um, initiatives and emerging standards that are addressing it. So the timing is finally right, and that's exciting. Excellent. You mentioned that a lot of companies are, you know, creating as bombs. Uh, if I ask you in general, how prepared was or is industry for this executive order? Because the fact is that a lot of companies, they don't want to disclose what's in there. Yeah, this is where we don't have enough data to figure out where the real gaps are. Um, it, in, it, even within a large company, if you talk to one person, they're going to tell you one story. And if you talk to another person, like if you talk to someone in the security department, they're going to say, no, we're not ready. If you talk to someone in the law department, they'll say, oh yeah, we're using SBOMs already. Um, so trying to understand what it actually is and what reality is looking like and where we need to put more effort on education. This is uh, what are the things we're sort of looking at trying to pull some data together. So there's a survey out that, you know, we'd appreciate anyone who's sort of watching this um, video to sort of take, take and, you know, click on the links below and uh, work the survey. And just give us your perspective on what's happening so that we can start to get a more holistic view as to what is, what, how ready we are as an industry. Because right now you, you get the full spectrum. And in some of the responses that came into NTIA's um, call for what is a minimum SBOM, um, you know, it did range the entire spectrum. If we just focus on, let's say, open source for now, uh, you, especially, you know, uh, from uh, Zephyr or, you know, other projects that you are involved with, you do interact with industry a lot. You, uh, and uh, you also work in a space where we look at IoT devices, uh, which are like, you know, <laughs> billions of devices there. So from the perspective of the consumers of open source project, how much awareness is there to not only build, but also share the bill of material? So um, companies like Wind River have been doing this now for eight years. And so their Wind River Linux, the VxWorks and so forth, um, they put that information up on the websites for some of the open source components and they will obviously share it with their customers directly. So there's companies out there, especially in the embedded space that have been used to doing this. Um, and so there's that side of the spectrum. And then there's, you know, um, a lot of other companies that, you know, if you pay them extra, they'll do it. <laughs> and I think they don't want to, you know, I think there's some resistance in that group to doing it because that's, a, you know, you know, 
you're going to make me do something just to even get in the door that I must be able to charge money for. Um, but reality is everything is changing so fast in these components that if we don't start automating it and just making it a basic expectation that you have a software bill of materials every time you get a, a binary from someone or an executable from someone, um, you know, we just can't keep up with all the vulnerabilities out there. One of the, um, you know, some people sort of like, well, does it, you know, doesn't it um, basically expose my IP or doesn't it, uh, you know, isn't it a roadmap to the attacker type of thing? And realistically, we're pro by providing software bill materials, what you're doing is providing a roadmap to the defender so that you know, you know, whether or not you've got a vulnerability in your system, especially as things age over time. Because, you know, you may have a product and it may have a lifetime support of two years or this open source project is only going to be supporting their release for, you know, a couple of years or a year or, you know, not even until the next release. Being able to be very explicit about what's there lets you actually manage your risk better, be it as an organization that's supporting an end product or be it as even as a consumer. If you just, like, once again, focus on open source, how prepared are open source, you know, projects, technology communities for this executive order? And I also want to touch a bit about the efforts that the Linux Foundation is making. Actually, when I look at the executive order, I was like, hey, you know what? As an open source community, we have been doing all of these things either way, you know? So it's kind of like, why the government was not doing it earlier? Why are they so behind? Well, um, it's not just the government, but open source projects for the most part one of the things in the executive order it says is like, you know, to the extent possible, document what open source you have. Well, open source projects are open source and they know it themselves. Um, but being able to generate out the software bill of materials easily and being able to have, you know, clean tooling available. There hasn't been a lot of tooling historically available for projects themselves that's free and freely available. So that's one of the things we're focusing on in this foundation is making sure we have tooling available such that it can go into the CI CD pipelines. Um, you know, and there's open source projects that can go in and do various types of analysis on your code base and on your binaries as well as, you know, on build infrastructure. So all of these things, we need to have the tooling available and uh, make it easy for open source projects to do the right things. And then that'll make it easier for companies to then pick the data up and then aggregate it. They're integrating, right? And integrating it together so that then they can provide it with their, you know, the pieces they add in to their consumers and everyone has a clear picture as to all the pieces that came in. And it isn't just the product makers that have to um, do all the work. So, you know, by some of these product makers helping to support the open source tooling, they're making their left low, you know, they're, they're improving, you know, the amount of work that they won't have to do <laughs> in, in this space. So having open source tooling available, but there's also commercial tooling out there. And, you know, we need all that too. So, you know, commercial tooling um, will probably enri help enrich the data, like by mapping it to vulnerabilities, by doing other types of scans associated with it. But, um, you know, commercial tooling isn't available to open source projects. And if we want to make the list easier, we need to make it easy for open source projects to have everything articulated very crisply when they put out the releases. Can you talk about the economic factor? Because uh, especially if you look at the IoT devices, sometimes a lot of vendors, uh, they uh, sell you know, the price point. There's no incentive to invest resources in building that because it, it is you know effort there are tools now but it's still you know there's no incentive plus sometimes in a lot of iot cases what happens is they sell one version of the device which runs a specific firmware and everything else and they move to the next one so there is nobody who even tracks what kind of updates are getting so how how big is this problem because we are all surrounded by our iot devices my lock is smart and i don't know when and how it gets uh, updates even my tvs refrigerators everything has some kind of embedded in it. Uh, so how serious is the problem and what can executive order do about it? Well, um, the problem is serious and what the executive order is doing about it is if you know, you're know you basically working to, with the US government, you're gonna be expected to do it. So once you have the tooling in place, it's perfectly, it's, you know, it's not that big a lift at that point in time to do it for your other customers as well. Now, one of the things that we're also seeing is um, People who are doing um, commercial contractual relationships and sort of in the procurement areas, um, by them specifying they expect a CNS bomb or some degree of this type of information, um, if someone's saying no, they can't provide it, that suddenly becomes a negotiation point. And they're gonna, you know, 
they're going to use that to negotiate down um, what they'll pay you. So it's more now of a, um, you know, if you don't have it, it's now becoming more of a baseline. And, uh, you know, if you can't make it easily available, they're going to look at your product a little bit more carefully and look at the, you know, because it's more risky as far as they're concerned. I think we're seeing a lot of innovation happening now in the embedded space in particular. Um, being able to generate out those software materials for the firmware images so that from one release to the next release and you know exactly what's in there, that's one of the areas we really need to work on focusing on um, automating so that it's just a byproduct of the builds as we make these firmware images. So it's not just at the server and the large component level. We need to do this all the way through the IoT chain because all of these elements are vulnerable. So there's going on in various projects like Zephyr that is actually trying to focus on how to do this and be effective and efficient. And we need more projects focusing on these types of things. Kate, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about uh, this executive order uh, and uh, the work that is going on in the open source community, especially at the Linux Foundation. Thanks for sharing your in insights and I look forward to talk to you again soon. Thank you. I look forward to it too. Thank you very much for your interest.